afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds presentation on Legionella outbreak investigations, a practical approach part two, uh, part two of a three part series. My name is Dr. Ginny Kim. I'm the physician lead for environmental and occupational health team at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, the chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Uh, please use the Q&A pod if you have questions during the session, and we will get to as many of them as we can at the end of the uh, presentation. If at any point during this session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding, all one word, at oahpp.ca. I would also like to state that as a moderator of this session, um, I am uh, a shareholder in my spouse's uh, design uh, firm as my conflict of interest. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today's presentation, Kelly Briscoe and Dr. Anna Majuri. Kelly Briscoe is a senior program specialist on the environmental and occupational health team at Public Health Ontario. Uh, she has a Master of Science degree in Food Safety and Quality Assurance, a Bachelor of Science in Public Health and Safety, and a Bachelor of Arts in Community Health Sciences. She is a certified public health inspector, or PHI, with over 15 years of experience in the environmental health field. Dr. Anna Majuri is a microbiologist at PHO with a specific in interest in environmental microbiology, including outbreak investigations, such as food, water, and Legionella. In addition to her diagnostic laboratory responsibilities, she values health equity research and has focused on the UN Sustainable Development Goal 6 in the context of rural drinking water in Ontario. So I'll now pass it on to Kelly to begin the presentation. Great, thank you very much, Ginny. So I would just like to get started. Sorry, I'll click back on there. Um, just to acknowledge that for both Anna and myself, uh, that we do not have any uh, relationships with a for-profit or non-profit organization to disclose. We would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the team of people who have provided support in preparing this presentation. So we'll move over to our presentation objectives. So by the end of this session, our goal is for you to be able to describe environmental risk assessments and sampling plan components for a Legionella investigation, describe environmental epidemiological and laboratory data and their interpretation in the investigation of a laboratory outbreak, and to describe control and remediation measures for Legionella in water systems. We wanted to first start off with a quick refresher from session one. So for anyone who was unable to attend that session, these are a few of the key points that were covered. So Legionella bacteria can be found in natural and human-made environments. Natural sources can include things like rivers, lakes, and soils. They can also be found in human-made sources, which may include building plumbing systems, uh, cooling towers and non-potable water systems such as spas or hot tubs and decorative fountains. Legionella bacteria can infect humans with inhalation of aerosolized contaminated water and may lead to legionellosis, which includes both forms of infection, which is Pontiac fever, and the more serious form of illness, Legionnaire's disease. Case investigations are important to identify potential sources of infection within the incubation period of 14 days prior to onset of symptoms. This would include potential sources such as travel history and exposure to any aerosolizing water systems. You may consider a Legionella cluster or outbreak when two or more cases are epidemiologically linked by location and the time of exposure. And during an investigation, conducting an environmental risk assessment is the first step in identifying potential sources of Legionella. One of the main components of this approach is to consider the case exposure history to guide or inform the environmental risk assessment. So our outline for today's session, we will go through developing a sampling plan 
Anna from the PHO laboratory will review aspects of the laboratory investigation, which will include clinical and environmental testing, specimen and sample collection, and interpretation of laboratory findings. We will also touch on remediation, and we will re review long-term prevention planning and highlight some of the key considerations for risk communication. So again, as a brief review from session one, the environmental risk assessment is a multi-step process. Uh, the CDC has developed a useful um, environmental risk assessment online form that can help guide you through documenting components of a water system to determine potential sources of aerosolization to help identify potential sampling sites. So prior to arriving on site, your first step would be to contact the site owner or operator. Um, and this is where you would plan for a visit with the owner or operator, um, any maintenance personnel or anyone who is knowledgeable in the water systems on site. And if they have an external water consultant um, that they have hired. You wanna advise the owner or operator to temporarily discontinue the use of any aerosol generating items as a precaution action prior to sampling. And you also want to um, also ensure to advise them not to implement any remediation actions because we need to ensure that the samples to be collected are representative of the potential source at the time of exposure to determine if there's any link to the cases. So we would then move to um, a visit on site where we would conduct interviews to gather information relevant to the facility and to the water system. We would then review documents, which would include any maintenance logs and any water schematics, um, again, to inform us of if there's been any um, remediation that's occurred in the system and if there's been any issues that they've been dealing with. We would then visit the location and conduct a physical survey of the location to identify and assess any potentially aerosolizing water sources. From here, we would then move to developing our water safety plan, which is what we're going to cover in today's session. So there's some overall considerations when preparing to develop your, your sampling plan. Sampling points are prioritized based on the case exposure history within the 14 days prior to illness onset, clinical laboratory information, and the environmental risk assessment. Sampling should be intentional informed by the case history and relevant to the sources of exposure. So in general, the purpose of sampling is to identify the source of contamination that resulted in illness. So in other words, we're trying to determine the source by finding the connection between the clinical and the environmental strains. And the only way to achieve, achieve this is to have both a clinical and an environmental isolate to determine if there is a connection. As previously mentioned, ideally the system should not be treated prior to sampling. We want the sampling to be valuable, so we need to ensure that the samples to be collected are representative of the potential source at the time of exposure. Measuring temperature, disinfection, residual, and pH at the time of sampling should also be conducted as these parameters can help determine factors that can lead to Legionella growth. So now we will get into how to start developing a sampling plan. So we're going to go back to session one again on our sources of Legionella. So essentially a contaminated source must have a means of creating and, and disseminating aerosols that contain Legionella. They're then inhaled or aspirated by a susceptible host. So our main sources include um, our potable water systems or indoor plumbing, cooling towers and non-potable water systems. But there are also a number of other potential sources that have been associated with illness and this list just provides a few. So there's a few general considerations when developing an approach to sampling. Specific sampling points should be strategically selected by considering the case exposure history and details of the water system, which are obtained during your environmental risk assessment. One of the key considerations in a sampling plan is you need to determine the actual how and where to sample, meaning what specific points within the water system may present a source of Legionella growth and aerosolization that could be considered for testing. So if we have cases connected to a spa or a hot tub, for example, you may wanna consider collecting swab and water samples at specific purposeful locations. 
So for example, swab samples could be taken at water jets or any spray or fountain features or along the water line where biofilm may, present, may be present. So these stars kind of indicate possible sampling sites for swabs. For water samples, they can be taken from the actual spa or hot tub itself. So to prioritize our sampling efforts, uh, aerosolized sources that the case may have been exposed to should be sampled first, followed by other high-risk sources. So for example, in a situation where the case is a resident in a long-term care home or a patient in a hospital setting, we want to focus on the case patient's room, including any faucets or shower heads or humidifiers that may be present in their room. We would then move to any common exposure sources that we have previously discussed, including spas or hot tubs, um, any hydrotherapy pools, cooling towers, decorative fountains, etc. We would then consider other high-risk sources or sites that may potentially contain the highest numbers of Legionella bacteria. Some of these examples would include hot water tanks, heat exchangers, distal ends or dead legs in the system where stagnation may occur, uh, storage tanks, uh, water risers that are um, usually in large buildings that help move water vertically through the floors, and expansion vessels. So sampling points selected may need to be continually reassessed. As the investigation progresses, more results and information become available and, and can help locate or rule out sources of Legionella. So when considering the sampling plan, it's also really important to take into account appropriate health and safety precautions for those who are conducting the sampling. So as part of the environmental risk assessment, which you've already mentioned, a meeting will likely be arranged with the facilities outbreak investigation team and may include the building or water maintenance manager and possibly health and safety members. So those visiting the site should be accompanied by that manager or health and safety committee uh, member or someone familiar with the water system. Uh, there may be situations where you need to provide or they need to provide access to restricted areas or support sampling by removing fixtures or aerators. So prior to the sampling visit, the facility should be notified to turn off any aerosolizing uh, generating devices to reduce the risk of exposure to the sampling team. Um, it is recommended that susceptible individuals or anyone who is immunocompromised are not involved in sampling. So after consulting with your health unit occupational health and safety team, there are appropriate um, PPE that may be considered for sample collection, depending on the facility and the setting. These are some examples. Um, so an N95 fit tested mask um, may be considered, for example, um, when sampling cooling towers, when fans cannot be turned off, or if you're conducting sampling in an enclosed space where aerosolizing generating devices uh, cannot be turned off. Um, you can also consider gloves. Um, they may be useful when sampling hot tub filters or areas with heavy biofilm. Safety glasses, vests, and hard hats uh, and safety shoes may also be considered, uh, depending again on the setting. And I will now pass it along to Anna to go over further details on the laboratory investigation. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so I will, I will be speaking you to, with you today about Legionella sample and specimen collection and testing. So given Kelly has walked you through the risk assessment and the sampling plan, I would like to share recommendations on how best to sample and submit to PHO's laboratory. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind you of the many laboratory resources on PHO's website, which includes our Public Health Inspector's Guide to Environmental Microbiology Laboratory Testing, and you will also find additional Legionella information in that guide, and it is also an excellent resource for other environmental microbiology investigations. Um, so with respect to environmental sample collection and sampling, one of the first uh, things to consider when you're faced with a, a Legionella outbreak or investigation is that we recommend that you connect with the laboratory in advance of any sampling. We can walk you through the sampling process and connect you with our PHO partners in environmental and occupational health and health protection who can assist with the development of an environmental risk assessment and a sampling plan. A thorough environmental risk assessment, as was reviewed by Kelly, is critical to resolving an investigation as it helps target sampling to the most likely sources. And although this slide may seem fairly basic, 
One of the first questions we are often asked when there is, suspicion, is a suspicion of an outbreak is what should be in my toolkit for a Legionella investigation. Given Legionella outbreaks are rare, some PHUs actually keep a checklist at the, re at the ready so that they can prepare the toolkit as soon as it is needed. As is detail detailed in the slide, uh, there are a number of different things that you need to include. Uh, the first of which are the environmental swabs and vials and the PHO water collection bottles. Make sure you have ample number uh, for the number of sampling sites that you are planning to be sampling before you arrive at the site. You'll also need a pen, of course, for completing the requisition um, and a permanent marker. You'll be working in a wet, uh, uh, potentially humid environment, and so you want to ensure that your labels do not smear. You, also, you will also need one of our PHO Laboratories transportation bags or uh, some sort of transport container, as well as coolant and ice packs. The requisition, of course, which you can find on our website, uh, a device to capture photographs. It's, it's helpful at times to photograph the sites that you're sampling, uh, as well as take photographs of any other areas of concern that you may have when you're doing your inspection. And then any additional instruments uh, or supplies that you need, as well as your PPE, of course, that are required to perform other analyses when you're investigating the site, such as uh, tools for, to take pH, temperature, and chlorine residual. Okay, next slide. This brings us to the requisition. You can download our environmental microbiology investigation requisition from our website. Ensure you have an ample number of uh, requisitions for the number of samples you intend to be collecting and submitting. We advise that you complete as much of the requisition as possible before heading to the sampling site and then complete it uh, once you have finished collecting your samples. Some of the key items we find are sometimes missed by the submitter will be reviewed today. Firstly, the submission type. Is it a pre or post remediation sample? If the samples were to have been treated, uh, for example, uh, prior to collection, then this will impact how the laboratory results will be interpreted. We also need information about, about the outbreak, including the outbreak number, the IFIS number, and any details, and any clinical information. For example, what specimen types uh, were submitted for testing on the clinical side, and what were those results? And for those of you who have worked through outbreaks previously, you will know that the sender's number is also critical. This number provides a unique identifier and allows for traceability. For the sample collection site, this can sometimes be a bit complicated. You know, for example, if you're collecting uh, a sample from a shower in a facility like a long-term care home, then it would be important to document, document the location as accurately as possible. And you may uh, decide to include such things as wing, floor, room number, uh, whether it's a sink or shower, and whether or not it's a pre or post flush sample. And finally, just a reminder that 10 PHO water bottles is the equivalent of one water sample. So when entering the samples on the requisition, keep in mind that it is one line per sample, not one line per bottle. In other words, 10 bottles should be numbered similarly and would equate to a single sample on a single line on the requisition. Next slide, please. So presuming you have established your sampling plan and you have your sampling kit and your PPE, you will then go to, on to collect your samples. You will begin, uh, with, once you arrive at the site and you've decided uh, which sites you're going to be sampling, uh, so say for example, it's a, a tap in a sink or a shower head, you'll begin by removing the aerator device. Uh, the swab sample should be collected first to capture any biofilm from the aerator, as well as swabbing the aerator once it's been removed, you should also swab the inside of the fitting to which the shower head or the aerator attaches. You do so, of course, using aseptic technique and you swab the surface at a 30 degree, 30 degree angle three times in reversing direction between strokes. Once you have collected the swab, place it in the vial and securely, secure it tightly to avoid any leaking. Use one swab per sampling site. Next, you will slowly collect your water sample. You're going to collect two liters of water aseptically and under the same conditions. Two liters is the equivalent of 10 PHO water bottles. You will want to collect both pre and post flush samples. Pre flush samples are collected immediately after opening the faucet or shower. In other words, do not let the water run before sampling. Remove the lid from the bottle without touching the rim and slowly collect two full liters into the 10 collection bottles. Secure the caps tightly. These samples represent the water being held in the fitting or tap. 
Once completed, you may then coll collect the post-flush samples. This water is collected to assess the contamination within the water system itself. Within the water system itself. Remember that all sample containers must be labeled using a permanent marker and double check to ensure that the unique identifier on the sample container and the requisition are both legible and match in order to avoid sample uh, rejection. Next slide, please. Samples should be kept at two to eight two to eight degrees during storage and transports, and all samples should be shipped in a hard walled shipping container with a lid secured closed and on ice. The outside shipping cooler or bag should be clearly labeled with the name of the submitting organization, the public health inspector's name, and the contents, for example, environmental samples, so that the samples can be directed without delay to the appropriate testing laboratory within PHO. In addition to asking that you connect with the laboratory in advance of sample collection, we also ask that you notify the laboratory of incoming samples so that we are appropriately prepared uh, to process and test them upon receipt. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, as mentioned, swabs are collected using the PHO swabs and collection vials. All swabs are put to culture, and if Legionella does grow, then we proceed to determine the species and serum group. Legionella typically grows in three to five days under the right conditions, but it may take up to 14 days, given the complexity of some of these samples. If there is no Legionella growth after 14 days, then the result is reported as Legionella not detected. For water samples, we first screen for Legionella using a triplex PCR assay for Legionella species, Legionella pneumophila, and Legionella pneumophila serogroup 1. PCR screening allows us to process a large number of samples and a large volume of water in a shorter period of time. The assay is quite sensitive, and a negative PCR result is a very result is a very good predictor of a negative culture. And as such, sources associated with negative samples can quickly be ruled out. The public health investigative team can then focus on sources for which samples are PCR positive while awaiting culture results. All PCR uh, positive samples are put to culture, again, for char further characterization, including species, serogroup, and of course, viability. Next slide, please. So this uh, brings us back to our case scenario, which this case uh, began in session one. Uh, you may remember that there were three cases of legionellosis and all of these cases were positive by the urine antigen test and all of whom live in the same condominium building. The index case also had a lower respiratory tract specimen collected and, this, and the results for that specimen were still pending at the end of session one. Next slide, please. So uh, the three outbreak cases, as I mentioned, had a urine specimen submitted and subsequently a presumptive positive urine antigen test. When submitting a urine, we recommend a minimum of two mils of urine collected into a sterile container. Specimens can be stored and transported to the laboratory at two to eight degrees. The UAT or urine antigen test does have its limitations. Specifically, it only detects a single species in serogroup, namely Legionella anomophila serogroup one. Therefore, a negative UAT does not preclude a diagnosis of legionellosis. Of note, the UAT may be negative during day one of illness. Thus, repeat testing on day two to three of illness may detect a small number who are test negative initially, particularly if, if uh, legionellosis is high on your differential. There can also be false positive results, so due to such things as rheumatoid factor, freezing and thawing of the sample, or excess urinary sediment. And further, some patients may excrete legionella antigen for weeks to months post-recovery. This can be particularly true in the immunocompromised, and this should be considered when interpreting the test results, especially in cases with low clinical suspicion or where an alternate diagnosis has been determined. Next slide, please. Okay, so back again to our case scenario. Uh, the condominium building in which these three cases uh, reside has a decorative fountain, a pool, which was closed at the time, a hot tub, and a rooftop cooling system. All three cases also reported using the shower in their private unit, uh, the condominium hot tub, and walking past the decorative fountain in the courtyard. So based on the environmental risk assessment, the following samples are collected and submitted for testing. Uh, the showers and shower heads from the individual cases units. Since this is uh, obviously um, a potential source of aerosolized water. Uh, the hot tub, the decorative fountain, the cooling tower, and then of 
course, we weren't able to sample the pool uh, due to it being closed for renovations. Next slide. So all of the samples were collected and submitted, and now all of the laboratory results have become available for the remaining clinical specimen and the environmental samples. The sputum for the index case was Legionella anomopola detected by PCR, and the specimen went on to culture with, with Legionella anomopola serum group one being isolated. This is not unexpected given the UAT was a presumptive positive for Legionella anomopola serum group one also. With respect to the environmental samples, we do have some interesting findings. None of the three shower samples from each of the cases, cases units had Legionella identified. The hot tub, however, was positive for Legionella anomopola seer group one by culture, as was the decorative fountain. And the cooling tower samples had no Legionella detected. So again, returning to the case scenario, uh, you'll remember that we have um, uh, the three cases are all diagnosed by urine antigen testing, testing and we've identified uh, a few common exposures. We also have, for the index case, a sputum that was submitted and an isolate cultured and identified as Legionella pneumophilus serum group one. For the, we have two potential environmental sources, the hot tub and the decorative fountain, uh, in which Legionella was detected and cultured and revealed this to be Legionella anomopolis serum group one, suggesting that either or perhaps both of these sources may have contributed to the outbreak. Moreover, given we have both, a cl both clinical and environmental isolates, we can do some further analyses in an attempt to gather additional evidence. Next slide, please. Um, this additional analysis is referred to as sequence-based typing. We require the culture and environmental isolates in order to perform this type of testing, which is why we recommend that a, a respiratory sample is collected where possible uh, when we're investigating these outbreaks. We perform this testing at PHO, and it is a means of determining the relatedness of clinical and environmental legional isolates in outbreaks. This typing is based on a comparative analysis of the nucleotide sequences of seven genes, which are, which are listed here on the slide. And based on the sequences of these genes, each gene is assigned a number code, and based on the seven-digit number code, a sequence type can be determined and assigned. This allows for the comparison of culture isolates, that is, the comparison of the clinical and environmental isolates, based on the sequence types, and it determines their related relatedness. There are numerous different sequence types possible, and although sequence-based typing does not have the same discriminatory power as whole genome sequencing, it does contribute to the evidence, particular, particularly when the sequence type identified is, a, is rare in a given region or country. So next slide, please. Again, returning to the case scenario, um, we have the index case with a clinical isolate from a sputum specimen identified as Legionella anomopolis serum group one, and two environmental isolates from the hot tub and the decorative fountain also identified as Legionella anomopolis serum group one, which suggests that one or the other of these environmental sources resulted in the outbreak. However, upon completion of sequence-based typing, it, it is determined that the clinical isolate and the environmental isolate from the hot tub are both sequence type A, whereas the sequence type identified for the fountain is sequence type B. As such, it is looking more and more like the hot tub is the source. So next slide, please. So for our particular case scenario, it turned out to be fairly straight, straightforward. Uh, and we have really good evidence that has identified um, the hot tub as the potential source. However, not all investigations go as smoothly as our case scenario, scenario, given how challenging Legionella outbreaks actually are. And thus, there are a few additional things to think about when the investigation does not go as expected. For example, it may be that we are unable to isolate Legionella from the, from the suspect environmental source or sources. This can happen as a consequence of the dynamic nature of the environment that is being sampled, given the levels of Legionella in water samples can fluctuate significantly over time. And the sample that you take only represents, uh, re represents the environment at that point in time. It may also be that the water system is overgrown with other microorganisms or contaminated with debris, or that it has been recently treated or disinfected, rendering Legionella non-viable or viable but non-culturable. And again, without an isolate, we can't, of course, perform sequence-based typing. And likewise, we may not have a clinical isolate if either the patient uh, was treated prior to respiratory specimen collection or no respiratory specimen was collected at all. 
Again, keep in mind that lab results apply to the sample and specimen is collected, handled, received, and received, which can, of course, impact the findings. Next slide. Uh, we also know that Legionella is an environmental organism ubiquitous in water sources, both natural and human-made, and that these environments can support multiple species, serogroups, and sequence types at any one time. As such, the isolate we identify from the suspect source may differ from what was anticipated, either a different species or serogroup or perhaps a different sequence type. Alternatively, it could be that the theoretical source is not the actual source, and if that proves to be the case, it may be prudent to review both the historical information and data, as well as any new information that may have emerged since the, since the samples were first collected. And of course, all lab results must be interpreted within the context of the clinical, environmental, epidemiological, and other investigation data or information. Next slide, please. So that brings us back to our case scenario. We have been fortunate to have undertaken a solid investigation with good uh, clinical epi and lab information and other data that strongly point to the hot, hot tub as the source of infection for this outbreak. However, this does not mean that the decorative fountain does not present a potential risk. At this stage, the PHU, the uh, public health unit, having received and collated all of the data, will proceed to communicate the findings to the building owner and operator who, if they haven't already ready, uh, based on the previous evidence, uh, closed the, down the, the fountain and hot tub will do so immediately. The owner and operator should then engage a water systems consultant and preferably one who has experience with Legionella, including uh, what is required for an appropriate and fulsome water safety plan and to ensure effective remediation. Okay, and with that, I turn it back to you, Kelly. Great, thank you very much, Anna. So we will move to immediate control measures and remediation. So depending on the type of setting or the device that's implicated as a potential source, immediate control measures and remediation plans can vary and are very unique uh, to each system. So again, depending on the system, there are some immediate actions that may be considered where possible. Um, for example, you need to consider the setting. Um, if you think about a long-term care home versus a hospital or versus an arena, um, they may have to consider the impacts of shutting down or turning off systems um, and how those impacts may affect the residents or users. Um, so stopping the use of showers in a long-term care home, for example, may have more negative effect, effects or impacts on the health and well-being of residents in comparison to draining and turning off a decorative fountain in a hotel. So essentially, um, if aspects of a water safety system is suspected as an outbreak source, the following immediate actions or control measures can be considered while the investigation continues. So in general, our goal is to remove or eliminate any water aerosolizing sources. If, um, so in general, so we also want to um, consider using sponge baths potentially instead of showering. Um, avoid the use of water from fountains, sorry, from faucets um, in residents' rooms to reduce the production of any aerosols. Uh, and where possible, you may be able to remove aerators, again, to remove any sources of aerosolization. Um, you can consider installing point of use water filters on faucets or shower heads that are capable of filtering out Legionella. These can provide uh, immediate control at individual fixtures, but they do not eliminate Legionella from the potable water system. Um, so even if we add those devices at the point of use, we could still have um, issues within the system and it still needs to be investigated. Um, so we also want to avoid the use of any hydrotherapy tubs. Uh, and for immunocompromised individuals or those with difficulties swallowing or at risk of aspiration, we may want to restrict the use of ice machines. Um, oops, sorry, I'm just gonna advance the slides here. Um, we may want to shut down decorative fountains or other unnecessary sources of aerosolization. Uh, and where possible, we may want to consider uh, shutting off control towers or turning off control towers, sorry, cooling tower fans. Um, and as this may present challenges as cooling towers can often be essential um, aspects of the operation of some buildings. Um, however, in some situations where when remediation is needed, online treatment or disinfection may be an option. 
So we also want to consider, and it's important to ensure that systems are not are shut off, but they're not drained prior to sampling. Again, because we want that sampling to be valuable. So if systems are drained, then we're not able to collect that information. So once the environmental source of Legionella has been identified, the owner or operator, and in some situations in collaboration with a external water consultant, may then develop and implement a remediation action plan. So this remediation action plan should include disinfection procedures that are effective against Legionella and minimize the adverse impact on equipment and building occupants. So a tailored approach accounting for water system characteristics, um, building uses and any risk or benefit considerations of the treatment should guide the remediation plan. So many disinfectants are used to control Legionella and biofilm, and they can also be corrosive and may be detrimental to the equipment and materials within the system. So this is again why it's important to consider working with a water system consultant to support the remediation plan. Uh, so I'll just mention the CDC provides some guidance for owners and operators to consider when looking for a water consultant, and that information is included in, in our resources section at the end of the presentation. So the most common methods of remediation um, are remediating any water systems are thermal disinfection and chemical disinfection, or possibly both. Um, combining thermal and chemical disinfectant can sometimes be more effective um, than either one alone. So as mentioned, um, we have two common methods of disinfection, which are thermal and chemical. Uh, and disinfection often options may vary depending on the system, the equipment, the cost, um, operator training, the water chemistry, and the type of use for that system. So as outlined in session one, temperature control strategies can be preventative. So maintaining temperatures between 25 to 50 to 55 on an ongoing basis, but they can also be used in remediation. So this heat shock approach generally involves increasing the water to a really high temperature temporarily and can be applied once or many times often reaching temperatures above 70 degrees Celsius throughout the entire system for a set period of time. You then would flush each um, at each outlet in the system to flush the, the water out of the system. There are a number of considerations with thermal disinfection. Um, you need to ensure that the system materials and equipment um, are designed and constructed to withhold high temperatures. Uh, you also need to be aware of locations of any uh, temperature mixing valves because thermal disinfection won't disinfect past that point of the mixing valve or downstream from the mixing valve. There's also the potential to dislodge particles from piping uh, or plumbing walls, which can lead to clogging. You also need to consider staffing requirements because you need to um, have this process supervised to protect staff, um, patients, and residents from scalding concerns. So chemical disinfections or, or disinfectants are also widely used um, and their goal is to inactivate microorganisms in the water and also to try to penetrate and inactivate microorganisms in biofilm. Uh, the most commonly used chemical is often chlorine. Um, and so you would first apply a set concentration for a period of time considering the setting. Uh, so for example, depending on the system, a consultant may recommend increasing the level of chlorine to say, four parts per million over multiple hours, or as high as 50 parts per million for one hour. Uh, in a healthcare setting, it may be more practical to apply these lower concentrations over a longer period of time, uh, considering the risk of potentially harmful impacts on residents and staff. However, this is always a very individualized approach, um, and again, why a, a water consultant can be so beneficial. So as Legionella can use protozoa or cysts to protect itself against disinfectants, application at multiple locations may be needed. Uh, and you also need to consider the potential impacts of corrosion on the system and the materials and equipment. Once the disinfection is complete, all the outlets would then be flushed um, to maintain a consistent residual. Um, and chemical disinfection of the water system may be recommended after thermal disinfection, again, just to boost the effectiveness. Um, and another la likely more costly option um, may be to consider physical um, adjustments, um, which may include removing or replacing any problematic units or equipment. Um, 
as well, post-remediation sampling may be considered to ensure recolonization of Legionella has not occurred. And this often can be the role of the water consultant to determine this as well. And just to highlight, uh, biofilms can be extremely difficult to get rid of, especially once they are established within a system. So wherever possible and depending on the system, uh, physical cleaning, let's say in a hot tub um, prior to chemical or thermal disinfection may improve the effectiveness of the remediation plan. Apologies for not skipping along a little sooner there. So just coming back to our case scenario briefly and to provide an update. So we've no new cases reported. The remediation and post-treatment sampling was completed and all results have come back as not detected. So this indicates we've successfully able to disinfect the system. And the owner operator is now looking to implement an ongoing maintenance and prevention plan. Uh, so the recommendation is then to establish a water safety plan. So what is the purpose of a water safety plan? So water safety plan identifies areas or devices that would support the growth of Legionella and to establish actions to prevent Legionella growth and overall risk of illness. So this image is a flow chart um, from the CDC toolkit that we have referred to, and it provides guidance on how to develop, implement, and evaluate a water safety plan. So there's a number of components um, involved in this. Your first would be to establish a water safety team, which can consist of a number of individuals, um, possibly the building owner, any maintenance or engineering, health and safety, um, any equipment or chemical suppliers, and possibly any contractors or consultants. You then wanna develop a building water schematic to describe and lay out all the systems and devices, um, as well as the flow and distribution of hot and cold running water. You would then identify areas where Legionella can grow, and this would um, include a risk assessment to identify any of these locations. You would then determine where control measures should be applied and how to monitor them. So control measures can be established for each control point um, that may include temperature levels, disinfection levels, um, flushing schedules, etc. You would then establish corrective actions for each control point, so essentially a contingency response plan to respond to unexpected problems. You want to make sure the program is running as designed and it's effective, and you then want to document and communicate all aspects of the plan with um, employees, consultants, and residents. And this plan, you want to ensure that you would review at least annually to ensure it remains up to date and applicable to the system and the setting. So how would an operator go about developing a water safety plan? So there's a few great resources that are available to help them get started. One document is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Con Conditioning Engineers. Um, this standard is a best practice document which focuses on identifying hazards or hazardous conditions and applying control measures to prevent Legionella growth. There is a fee associated with the printable version of this document. However, there is a free online option and the links are available uh, in the resources. We also have the CDC document that we have mentioned um, previously. This is a free and practical guide and models the ASHRAE document, but in more plain language. Um, it also includes special considerations for healthcare facilities. And there was also the Cooling Technology Institute Guideline 159, which is considered best practice for the control of Legionella in cooling towers. There is a fee associated with this document, so I just wanted to make note of that. So to support long-term prevention, a key strategy or approach for reducing the risk of Legionella or Legionnaire's disease is through a multifaceted preventative program. And the main principles of a water safety plan are aimed to prevent water stagnation, ensure adequate disinfection, maintain appropriate temperatures, and maintain equipment to prevent biofilm scale and corrosion. All aspects of a water safety plan work collectively to minimize an environment that would support the growth of Legionella and each aspect on their own cannot guarantee risk elimination, but the key in prevention is to control the risk through a combination of multiple interactive measures. So risk communication is also an important aspect of a Legionella investigation, and it should include a two-way exchange of information regarding health risk. Uh, outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease may attract quite a bit of media and public attention, depending on the number of cases involved and the severity of the outbreak. 
Public health units should uh, develop a communication strategy that provides timely and accurate information to those who need to know about the risk, measures being taken to investigate and mitigate the risk, and individual actions that can be taken, if any. So in preparing the strategy, you may want to consider uh, these questions that are provided here for you. Also, depending on the setting, you may have targeted messaging. For example, a long-term care home may decide to issue letters to families, or if it's a cooling tower that's implicated, there may be a press release that's con considered. Uh, and the CDC has developed uh, communication resources to help public health settings manage outbreaks um, and their communication plan. So in summary, um, a legionnaire investigation involves multiple aspects. So it typically would begin with a case investigation or case exposure investigation, um, where we collect information on exposure details to identify possible sources. And this is what focuses the environmental investigation. The outbreak investigation applies the information that we have collected on the case exposure to guide the environmental and laboratory investigations. The environmental investigation includes a risk assessment and the sampling plan. The laboratory investigation includes clinical and environmental aspects. And our results may indicate a connection between the clinical and environmental isolate. But as Anna mentioned, this is not always the case. Um, and then we have a plan to remediate the source, which may be thermal or chemical disinfection. And then our long-term plan of prevention would consist of a water safety plan. I'm just gonna take this opportunity to highlight the June 8th session with Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, uh, where they will be outlining a recent outbreak that they experienced with a cooling tower. Sorry, just gonna add that detail there. And these are some of the resources that um, we have mentioned throughout the presentation. And I will pass it back to Janine. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly and Anna, for a very informative and hopefully a very useful and practical presentation. Uh, we will now move on to the Q&A segment of this event to address some of the questions from our audience. And as this is the second of a three-part series, we've invited some of, um, some of our other colleagues, uh, uh, especially uh, Alana Murphy and Dr. Austin Zygmunt, um, to the panel. Elena Murphy is a senior laboratory lead at Public Health Ontario, and Dr. Zygmunt, who uh, spoke last week, is a public health physician also with PHO. So thank you both for joining the Q&A segment of this event. And a quick note to our attendees to please continue to enter, enter your questions into the Q&A pod if you have not already had an opportunity. And we will get to as many as we can. There are a few questions that have already been answered. Um, and some great comments uh, coming up as well. Uh, one of the first uh, comments um, uh, saying that um, as, as part of the preparation for creating a sampling, it's helpful to get the plumbing schematic for how water flows through the building and develop a sampling plan sufficient to characterize the recirculating uh, water and distribution system. And, and that's actually a great point. And we do refer, we, we do kind of in some of, um, our PHO consults, we, we do uh, work with um, uh, public health units to, to see if those uh, kinds of drawings may be available to help us locate um, uh, strategic areas to sample. So thank you for that. Uh, there's another uh, comment as well um, that the US CDC does not recommend thermal shock of water systems due to frequent failure and rapid recolonization of Legionella and potable water systems. And we are aware of uh, um, the resistance Legionella, <clears throat> some Legionella strains to heat. And so that's, um, that's, a, that's a good point as well. And I think just goes to show how every system um, is quite unique and depending on the circumstances, um, even the best kind of conceived plans uh, may need to be modified to uh, be tailored to the building or the system um, in question. So really important to do the um, outbreak and uh, environmental uh, lab investigations. But then, you know, there's another whole uh, side to remediation that Kelly just touched on that I think um, probably is, is a big uh, um a talk probably, uh, or several talks on their own. Uh, there's another question here. Um, uh, is Legionella also spread as an aerosol? If so, why not test the air at the same time for samples? Uh, samples, uh, for example, around a decorative fountain, shower room, and flushing toilets. Um, 
can we test uh, the air and water? And this sort of combines, this was sort of addressed, um, uh, partly addressed uh, last week as well. So I'll just let um, the speakers address, uh, address this question. Is it spread as an aerosol? And I think um, as the first question, thanks. be spread through inhalation of aerosolized particles. And in terms of the, the testing of air, I'll leave that to um, others to speak to. I can take that one. Thank you, Austin. Uh, there wouldn't be, it is true, it, it, it's aerosolization that is the key. And, and then uh, the case would inhale that contaminate, those contaminated particles. But there's little utility in, in testing the air um, in terms of uh, being able to isolate or identify Legionella, the, you get the greatest uh, gain by uh, swabbing the biofilm uh, or collecting the water samples themselves. So it wouldn't really add anything to the investigation. In fact, it may detract from it because you're spending time uh, analyzing those samples when there's really very, li very little or limited utility. Thanks very much, um, Anna and Austin. Is there a way, this is another, another question, is there a way to take a bulk water sample of standing water, like a puddle or basin, where water bottles cannot be submerged into the water? Uh, is there a way to maybe perhaps uh, use a pipette uh, to aspirate the water in order to take that sample? And any recommendations on these types of scenarios? Go ahead, Lana. I can take the question. Yeah, thank you. So that's a great question. So for difficult and hard to receive or hard to collect uh, samples or difficult sampling locations, we recommend a sterile sampling bag, which can be used to collect the bulk water sample. And then that can be decanted into the approved PHOL collection bottle for uh, storage and transport to the lab. Thanks, Janine. Great, thank you. I think there's a comment uh, about Legionella mode of transmission as well, which um, has been um, addressed. There's another comment as well about uh, the health and safety executive in the UK that has a variety of uh, free resources that, um, that are available. And yes, these are great websites and uh, we've used their resources as well um, previously. Okay, so looking through, um, there's a question about water safety plan for a healthcare facility, I think, um, HCF. So who typically develops the water safety plan for a healthcare facility? So it may depend on um, the facility and the team that they currently have. Some facilities have some employees on site that are very knowledgeable about the water system um, and how to um, apply those preventative measures. Some locations that do not have that capacity internal may hire um, a water safety consultant that can help support the development of a water safety plan. Um, and some of those resources that were shared in the presentation might help to um, initiate that or get that process started. Right. Thank you. And uh, there's, a, there's a related question about resources available to help facilities develop a water safety plan. And I think, I think you've um, uh, uh, initially uh, you've, you've provided some resources and um, info there as well for that. Uh, there's, a, there's another question about the actual sampling procedure. Um, should pH testing be done at the point of sampling? Does the lab do a pH or does the lab do a pH reading of uh, submitted water samples, maybe and or? What do you recommend for testing pH on site? So I'll let um, Anna or Elena comment on what the Public Health uh, Ontario Lab can do, but there are um, pH devices or recordings that you can use to, to monitor the pH on site. Um, but I'll let maybe Anna or Elena comment on the lab piece. Uh, I think the question was, does the lab perform pH testing uh, on the samples when they're received? And no, we do not. We rely on the public health inspector to do that at the time of sampling. Thank you. And 
And just a question about the logistics of collecting uh, 10 separate bottles. Um, is, there, uh, is, is, is there a possibility to have a larger bottles available, for instance, one liter containers? At this stage, I'm going to say no. There's also the, the issue of managing those bottles within the laboratory. So uh, maneuvering a one liter bottle uh, through the various processes is challenging. Uh, and uh, for our purposes, we um, have chosen that size of bottle and, and have elected to stay with that size of bottle because it's the same bottle that we use for all water sampling. Uh, for testing at PHO, so to keep it simple. All right, thank you. Okay, so a challenging question. What if resident cases, uh, what if resident cases are identified and no environmental source is linked to, is linked to, uh, linked to uh, the case? Under those conditions, would you recommend closing those if we can um, and treat the sources? So actually quite a quite a realistic question because I think uh, th this this can certainly happen so there are cases identified no uh, no environmental source that's linked to uh, them so maybe I can start off um, as you mentioned to me that can definitely happen um, and it may be very dependent on the setting um, and the type of water sources or aerosolization sources that um, that case may have been exposed to. So it's really not um, a very clear yes or no answer that you would close or remediate, but you would definitely um, consider it uh, based on the lab and exposure history. Um, you kind of use all that information collectively to, to make that determination. So it's not really a yes or no. Um, it's just that each situation is very unique and a number of considerations need to be uh, taken into account. Any further thoughts from Anna or Alana? Okay. Um, just another uh, question, quick question about um, the use of a swimming pool water test kit for pH testing, would that be acceptable? I think depending on the test kit that you're using um, and how accurate it can be, um, it would be possible, um, I would think, to use that to test your pH of the water. Right. Okay, and I'm just recognizing that we are actually uh, at one o'clock or 101 now. Um, so unfortunately, there are a couple of other questions, but uh, we're gonna have to close off the session. Uh, so fine, as we wrap this up, um, today's P PHO rounds. I, I do want to thank again uh, Kelly Britsko and Dr. Anna Majuri for presenting and also want to thank uh, Elena Murphy and Dr. Austin Bigman for joining us. A special thanks to everyone who joined us for today's webinar and a quick reminder that today's session was part two of a three-part series. Um, part three again will be held June 8th and it will describe a cooling tower associated outbreak uh, investigated by Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. Uh, lessons learned and approaches used to communicate with the public. So you can expect um, as well after this session to receive a brief and anonymous PHO round survey. Uh, please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. And lastly, to access uh, past PHO rounds presentations, including the one from last week and view uh, the confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website head to education and events and click on presentations. Uh, so thank you very much again and have a wonderful day.